Hello and welcome to the Gratitude and Growth Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Midditch. I am an actor, a yoga instructor, a former ballet dancer, but above all, I am a wildly curious person. So I've spent the past several years researching and studying human behavior, why we do what we do, who and what we innately are, what my purpose is on this planet. And I'm here to share the insights and the tools that that curiosity has led me to uncover in hopes of helping you to navigate the inevitable ups and downs of your own life and in hopes of inspiring you to become the person that you have always wanted to be. So pull up a chair or go for a walk, hop on that treadmill or go for a drive and join me as I explore what it is to be a human being in this lifetime. Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode. I have a guest with me today that I am so honored to have on the show. His work has inspired kindness, compassion, and love in my own life and in the world as a whole. His words make you feel so seen and understood and seem to motivate you just exactly when you need it most in your own journey of growth and healing. He is a writer and an artist. Please let me introduce the incredible Topher Kirby. Hi, Topher. Quite an introduction. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I have been following you on Instagram for a few years now, and your words just helped me get through certain transitions in my life. And so truly, I cannot thank you enough for coming on here and chatting with me. Well, it really is a joy to come on and share. I'm happy that the work connects in that way. Um, that's why I do it. So to hear that is really meaningful to me. So I appreciate it. Okay. Can we start with you sharing a bit about yourself of what got you to be a writer, an artist? I don't really know your steps that led you onto this path. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. Um, Writing is something I've done my entire life to kind of process whatever situation I was going through. I think when I was in high school um, and maybe even younger, I learned to journal just kind of naturally. So it was a way for me to express complicated ideas in a way that made sense. I could break it down. I could read it. I could look at it. um, And through that, I was able to like move through some stuff, good things, bad things, whatever. So it was just kind of like a casual thing I've always done. Um, So I was always drawn for writing first. So that's how it began. And then as kind of the journey progressed, certain things in life came that were maybe more of a challenge or required more like emotional intelligence or awareness. And I'm always been kinesthetic, so I'm hands on. And so when the words became not enough, it like was a natural transition into um, art from there. So it's been... um, I guess a very like natural progression from words to art in that way. You have so many quotes that I love so much, <laughs> but I'm going to talk about a few of my favorite. Uh, okay. The, the, the first one being, how many books do you have out now? I believe I have six poetry and art books, and then I have a couple other books as well. And I'm actually putting the final touches on my newest book. Yeah. So it'll be seven. Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. Um, yeah. I have your two books, Life Isn't Made for Perfect People. Mm-hmm. And I love them. They're my go-to. Sometimes I just open them up to a random page and read a, a few writings, whatever intuitively I feel I need that day. And you have this quote, Life isn't made for perfect people. It's made for those who know how to turn an impossible situation into something beautiful. And that really hit me because, I mean, the podcast is called Gratitude and Growth. And I think growth is this never-ending cycle and growth helps us pull away from trying to be perfect all the time because we associate being perfect with being, you know, like shiny, clean, everything's together. But There's such a beautiful perfection in understanding that in the growth, in making these impossible situations into something beautiful, that that is where the perfection and the magic exists, at least for me. But I wanted to 
ask you about this quote and where it comes from for you and what it means for you. Absolutely. I think that's the defining quote uh, of my career. It's definitely one that's written on my heart. And it comes from this awareness that perfectionism is something that maybe a lot of us are brought up into or intentionally or unintentionally, the world environments, uh, family, friendships, work. It's this idea that there is something perfect that can be obtained. And so what we do is we gather up all these tools and we gather up all this effort and we go forward toward this imaginary perfectionism goal that doesn't exist. It never happens. It never comes because that's not what we're built to be. We're built to be human beings, imperfect, flawed, beautiful. Like the concept of perfectionism isn't us. And so when we lay that down, it actually opens up life in this powerful, beautiful, exploratory way where it's like, oh, this thing that I thought I had to be, well, I'll never be that. Well, let me step back then and like reevaluate. I can do anything I want to do now because it doesn't have to be in a perfect way. So I think through my journey as a writer and creator and just as a human being, I've always been drawn to people and helping people know that they aren't alone in the way where we go to bed at night and we feel like, man, if I could do this day again differently, I would have all these thoughts running through our brains. And that's that worry. That's that perfectionism. When we lay down, there's a quote that I love that is just about doing your best. And that involves that idea of perfectionism too, where it's like, when we do our best, it isn't like I'm, I went out and I ran the fastest I could run. I did everything I could do. I painted everything today. I was the the best dad, I was the best person that I could possibly be. That's not how it goes. You lay down at the end of the night and you're like, I did my best and today sucked. You know, I was, I failed more than I won. And that's, that's my whole uh, passion with, with the work that I do. And specifically with that quote. I want to riff on that for a sec, because it's something I too am really passionate about. And it's exactly that we're all striving for this drive to be perfect, to get the straight A's, to get that paper checklist that somewhere in our lives, I don't know when exactly we feel like we have to put together and then check off all those boxes. But I feel like there's such a freedom when you realize that that checklist is not actually life. Like it's some thing that you're striving for that maybe but most likely does not exist and that it's so opposite to our innate human nature which is to be messy you know like I think those days that are the messiest the days where you feel more than you quote unquote win it's like these are the days that also define you how you show up on those days the grace that you give yourself on them the grace that you give other people on them those are the days for me that have shaped my personality into who I want to be more than the days where everything seems to be going great. Right. Yeah. No. And I think that that realization is by living. I think we, when I was a much younger man, I thought I had everything figured out and I thought I knew the plan and I had all the answers. And, but what you end up doing as you age and you grow and you learn and you experience all these things, you realize like, I've never known anything much. I've never experienced it all. And the more I've learned, the less I know. And that's the way it is with, I think, letting go of perfectionism. You realize that that perfect version of you or whatever you're going to do doesn't exist. And so it takes, it takes a lot of pressure off. But I do think that like it is more of our natural state to be okay with our humanness. I think that we do are born into that. Like as children, we experiment, we are artists, we are explorers, we take risks. And that is because we aren't worried to fail because it doesn't, there isn't any pressure in there. We fail, we try again, we learn something new, we grow. That, that childlike heart, um, when we embrace that as adults, that's what lets us set down perfectionism and actually step into like really positive growth areas. Yes, absolutely. What are some tools that you use for yourself? I mean, do you still find yourself having that pull sometimes to pull into that perfectionism? Or when, when those things come up for you, what are some tools that you actually use to kind of bring you back and like ground you back into the reality of that humanness? 
I'm big on visualization. I'm big on reflection. So if I'm kind of two pronged answer to this, but if I'm doing something new, I like a podcast, for example, for the first time, I like to visualize myself ahead of time, doing the thing, going through it, mental gymnastics a little bit, like how it's going to be. And so I kind of run through what, what may work and what may go wrong. Okay, well, if this happens, then maybe you can be more chilled out about it and not freak out. That's a small example to like the big part of life. I do that all the time. It's like, well, what's the worst possible thing that could happen? Okay, well, let's play around with my mind, not in a negative way, but I like to visualize it and be like, well, here's some responses I might do if that did happen. And it lets me relax and be like, okay, well, those are kind of some situations that may happen and I can let those kind of go. So I'm big on visualization in that way. You mentioned you reflect a lot. What does that mean for you? Right. So reflection is a big, I feel like reflection is a solitary endeavor. And I think that that aloneness or that time with yourself, the one-on-one conversations with nothing, no distractions, as much of yourself as you can stand, that means the healthier you're growing as a person. So reflection allows you to sit in that space, you know, metaphorical darkness, with your own mind and your own questions, your own ideas and think, what am I doing? What's going on in my life? And how can I address that? So whenever I really need to process something, uh, I'm a big cycler. I'm a big hiker. Uh, Nature is like, as if you follow my work for very long, is a huge influence in everything I do. And that's because it is a solitary space where everything is more powerful and more grand and more beautiful than I will ever be. And so you feel small in the most warm and welcoming way. And so that allows me to sit and reflect in what I'm doing. So if I'm going on a long cycling trip or just out for a ride, I don't have music typically. It's just my mind and me and a conversation. And that is a skill that I think everybody should grow because it's really difficult at first, because especially these days, I mean, not to sound like an old man, but there's so many distractions and there's so many like things that just like pull our attention constantly. Me too. Believe me, I have an ADHD brain that is a thousand places at once. And to try to get it to focus on where I'm at has been a skill that I've been working on my entire life. And so I think for the first time in a very long time, I understand the power of stillness and quiet and peace. And then that's the place where I've grown the most in those times. Do you find that when you're in those places, you get more creative downloads? Do your writings, is your art sometimes inspired by those places? Absolutely. Yeah, it absolutely is a a huge source of inspiration. And it's from the environment for sure. Nature is one of those things that like always is teaching. Um, It's always just existing in a way that brings out creativity. And I think if you were talking about tools earlier, The number one tool that I think everybody can do to process any emotion, any difficulty or anything you're going for is create. And that doesn't mean you need to be an artist or a writer or a dancer or whatever it may be. It means do something, Uh, you know, chop up some food in the kitchen, create something that is delicious, that, that causes you to step outside of whatever you're doing and make something new from nothing. Um, creation is definitely like a healing part of life. And so that is from those spaces when we have our alone time and when we have that solitary, you know, space to exist in, creativity can grow from that if we learn to listen. So definitely creation. I love that. And what you said about the distractions, I totally agree. And I think, I mean, A, we're just bombarded. We're just bombarded all the time now, everywhere. And our minds are overstimulated. And For me, I find that my creation, when I am trying to create or trying to produce a creation, when those distractions are pulling me right, left, and center, I I can't get the downloads. It's, It's in the silence. It's in the stillness that I'm able to come to that answer that I need. I'm able to create something. Um, I always say it's in the silence that you actually meet to yourself. And sometimes that's hard and sometimes that's scary. And it's, it's definitely a muscle that I needed to work on and to build because at first it can be a bit of a scary place. But then 
once you're able to do it and you do it more and more and you build that muscle, being able to reflect has also built a lot of self-love in the process. Right. Yeah. And that is where it comes from. And because I, I think that in the modern era, the idea of self-love is a complicated journey because I think many of many people from my generation or others and everybody gathered up self-love at first, when you talk about it, it feels very selfish. Like if you tell someone that um, I'm really focusing on myself right now, or I'm doing the things that are healthy for me, they're thinking, okay, well, what are you leaving now? Like, who are you leaving behind? And so what that whole push really opened up was this idea that when you heal you first, when you fill up your you know vessel first from that source, then you're able to flow out like goodness and kindness and joy and all these kind of things that we all need in life. But it can also be a, there, there's a tipping point where it's like, there is so much of the time that we can fill up ourselves. And that is a great endeavor. Everybody should do that. But if at a certain point you don't feel enough inside of you to give, then it, it does turn out to be kind of like, not a pointless endeavor, but one, not a whole endeavor. Because the whole journey of that should be at the end of the day to be healed enough where we can help others heal. And I think that's the place where self-love and, and those inward journeys, the goal should be eventually to share outwardly as well. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's working on yourself and learning to love yourself so that you can give and you can give without needing anything in return because you're full. Otherwise, right. I think love in every capacity, romantic, friendship, family, I think love becomes transactional sometimes. And it's like, well, I'll give you this, but what am I getting in return? But when I learned to fully love myself, I was able to love so much stronger and I could see so much more beauty in the world. And I had more kindness and patience and compassion without needing it back from people because I wasn't depleted. And that's really what it comes down to is I think in my own personal journey, getting to the point where I felt healed enough, where I did enough work personally um, to be able to set some things behind and also recognize, you know, flaws and ideas that I needed to work through personally. When I was able to take the time and put in the work to do those things, then it's like the whole other part of the healing journey opened up. And it was like, once that part of me was healed, then it allowed that to be shared with others. So I agree completely. And it becomes a really beautiful thing. And, you know, joy ends up becoming a steady state sometimes when you can operate from that. But for me, too, I had to go through some darkness to get there. And I had to, you know, put that mirror up to myself and be like, OK, what parts are here that need help? Like what parts are here that are not OK right now? And I think naming those parts first and exactly what you said, healing those parts, working on those parts, then let me take the next step of like taking that out into the real world. I think like when, when I think about a person's own personal journey toward healing, I think of creation being a part of that. Like I said, I think when we step out, we have to have experiences that are kind of outside of our normal world. So whatever bubble we're brought up in, whatever shell that we're, that we're gathered up in, if we have to break through that and like have other experiences that push our way of thinking and dreaming and loving and all those kind of things. But what we don't like to talk about, that's the fun part. And what you kind of mentioned on is suffering. When we, the true work happens after we usually experience something that's difficult, something that maybe like push us to our breaking point, or like I say, it pushed us so far down that it took us a long way to bend back up to who we were or to get back to the sun again. And I look back on the most difficult moments in my life and those tough times that I had to get through and that suffering, and I wouldn't wish it on that person. I wouldn't wish it on my old self, but then again, I wouldn't be to where I am today without it. And I think you look at um, other people and you, and you think, well, if you really want to get where you want to go, you're going to have to go through some difficult times. And sometimes that means self-reflection, opening yourself up and looking at yourself with eyes and being like, you know what? There's some things here that really shouldn't be. There's some healing that needs to be done. There's parts of me that need to grow. And that's a difficult journey. 
in and of itself, even if that's just the base level that you're going on. Going back to what you just said of the suffering and witnessing yourself in the past, kind of, and you wouldn't wish it on anyone. That for me is where my favorite thing in the whole wide world, gratitude, came in of now I can see that suffering and I can see all of that and be so grateful for the hurt and the pain that life caused me, other people caused me. And finding gratitude for that was like the biggest part of my healing. And so now when things come that are tough, I'm like, hey, this is meant to teach me something. This is an opportunity for me to grow through it again. And now I at least have these tools to try to navigate this next step in my own evolution as the human being that I am to get to that next place that I'm meant to get to. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the most beautiful way to look at life. It's through the eyes of gratitude. But I don't think you get there by mistake. I don't think you get there by stumbling into co the conclusion that it's, it's a good thing to wake up being grateful. I really think it's like a choice and a mindset of way to living. Waking up and reflecting again on like what has been going on, like in reflecting on looking at your past and being like, yeah, it wasn't perfect. You know, people probably did the best they can do. And maybe I'm grateful for the journey that brought me here, even though it was challenging, that kind of stuff. Or I'm grateful for the person that I am now because it's different than who I used to be. Like that kind of gratitude, again, that inward, outward, inward, outward relationship that we have with this life. That's so important. Like it does start with within, that gratitude within yourself. But then if you're not sharing that and extending it to others, it feels like, again, it feels like a bit of a waste and I'm probably repeating myself with that, but I just believe it so much because it's like, I really feel like we're here to share our stories with each other. I really feel like we're here to make those connections with one another. And if we're not doing that, I feel like we're missing out on some of the most important parts of life. And I see you doing that in your work, which is, have you always felt the calling to do that? Or was that more through, you know, a transition or a transformation in your life? Have you always felt that calling to give? Yeah, I think so. I, you know, and I think when we're young, we're more in tune with, I'm big on that. When we're young, we're more in tune with like what we're really here to do. I feel like, I don't know what it is on the, on the spiritual realm or, or the human realm. I feel like most of us understand that there's something more to this existence than just the human state. And I feel like when we open ourselves up to whatever that might be, you do tap into some kind of special energy. And I feel like I've always desired to like connect with people in a way that's authentic and saying that it's okay to not be perfect. And I know that's what we've been talking about. It's okay to, you know, make mistakes and to fail and to try things and not just to be like show up, it's this like perfect polished version of yourself. And I kind of had ideas of like where that would take me when I was younger. And of course, life goes certain ways and you take different paths. But here I am at the end of it, still like connected to that passion, you know, to that part of me that wants people to understand that it's okay to feel lost and it's okay to feel sad and broken and, you know, feel like you don't fit in into the to the world and like the rest of us feel that way too and the more we can share that with one another the like more seen and understood and like happy and loved we all feel so on some level i've always wanted to do that and i think it's just weaving and going through the paths of life that brought me to doing it this way if i wasn't a painter and if i wasn't a writer i would be doing it some other way and i may you know different parts of my life. It may take me a new direction as it has in the past, but I always think the core of what I do will be that, will be that idea. I love that. This might be, and you totally don't have to answer this question if you want, if you don't want to, but are you a spiritual person? I think that, I think that we all are in our own ways. And I think that that's the open dialogue that that I like to share with everyone. And I think it's a question that is interesting to people, but I also, it's one that I want people to, to embrace on, on their own terms. And so it's like, I am open to the idea of, of many things, but I do think that whatever works for someone I support and that if it makes them feel um, more complete in this life, then it's a good thing. Um, when it 
teeters on something different than that. It's not something that I'm passionate about. Um, but I, I mean, I do like to support people on their own journeys in those, in those aspects. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. I totally get that. Do you do certain things every day to keep your mindset, keep you grounded in this grateful, joyful, positive mindset? Yeah, and absolutely. It would be wonderful if I woke up every day in a grateful, joyful mindset. You know, that would be, <laughs> that would make things a lot easier. Um, I do more often than than not, that's for sure these days. But it's like a reset. Um, also, when the days when you feel differently, that's okay too. You know, those are days that are important. Often find like, um, I think, again, stage of life, understanding who I am at this point and like the ups and downs and that the most important lesson, I think that if I were to reach down and, and talk to my younger self or to someone who is similar to me going through those early journeys is it doesn't last forever. When you talk with people um, as you do and the I do that come in through, um, I have an art gallery here in town that people come from all over and we basically we sit down, we look at art, we share, but we share our stories, you know, and people come in and maybe they're going through a big transition in their life. It's a big change and they want to share some of that. They want to connect with the work or the words in, in a certain way. But a lot of times people come through that are dealing with loss, you know, dealing with pain, dealing with moments that are really difficult to understand. And What's important during those times is to be able to, to listen and to open up and be like, we're at this stage where we, where we both understand, or we all understand that these moments don't last forever. And I don't know if you've experienced the loss of a close friend being in the artistic realm or writers, just creative people, they have this bright, powerful light and it's a spark, but sometimes that runs out for certain people. And they feel like that's the end and that there is no more hope after that point. And it's like when you get to the point and you've experienced those moments and you've made it through, the most powerful gift you can give to other people is saying, I know what those moments feel like. It feels impossible. That darkness feels like it will go on forever. But I promise you it doesn't. And you couldn't convince someone in those moments that it would be any different than that is forever. But that's kind of what I really want to share with people. And that was the turn in my work. Um, when I first started out, I had kind of a different tone, a different take. There was the darkness. There was a lot of pain that I was going through and I was expressing it in a certain way, which was fine. It was honest. And I write from a place of honesty always. It's what I'm going through. It's what I'm living. I can't do it any other way. But there was moments in my life where I lost some friends, um, some people that I knew went through difficult times and some of them didn't make it through. And I thought to myself at the end of that and through those experiences, I didn't want to be anything other than a message of hope. If someone was going to read those words for the last time, or if it was the last thing that they were going to read before the night or the morning, whatever it may have been. So I was like, yes, Life is difficult and it's hard and it's downright impossible at times, but it's also so beautiful and worth it. And there is light on the other side of this pain. And so that was the turn in my work and that has changed my life completely. Um, and it was making that, you know, I want it, I want it to be honest with people that, that life is difficult, but it's also so beautiful. And if you can help people see that more, then it gives them an opportunity to, to get through their tough times too. Yes. You know, I saw this thing and this is what Instagram is great for of, you know, once you set the algorithm to the positivity that you want, things <laughs> pop up. But I saw Tom Hanks do this interview and the quote was, everything is temporary. The highs are temporary. The lows are temporary. It's all temporary. But I think we forget that. I love that because it is temporary. And I think that that's, I think the circle of our conversation is this like beautiful connection in the way where if you've experienced enough things in life, that's the trick. Like I was a teacher before I was all of this. And that was the greatest gift is being able to 
connect with young people at that age and let them know that things are temporary. But we don't know that until we've lived through them, right? The, the first time we experience heartbreak or loss or we lose a grandparent maybe at that age or we go through our first relationship that breaks our heart, that feels like it will last forever. You know, it feels like the most powerful pain or the most joyful joy that will continue the rest of our lives. And it doesn't. But you don't know that until you've lived through it. And if you live through it enough of times, you get stronger and stronger. And hopefully you're paying attention. And maybe that's just some of us take the time or have the time or do what we need to do to process emotions. But like we end up understanding that like piece by piece. Oh, I've been here before. This is what I did when this happened. Okay. It lasted about three days last time, this period of darkness. Okay. Well, maybe this time I can add some tools and I can shorten that up a bit. Or I understand that like there is an end to this good or bad or whatever it may be. But yeah, understanding that everything is temporary is like a life hack. I mean, and that's like the the key to everything. It's the key to happiness. It's the key to like productivity or, or whatever it may be in life for sure. And understanding that it's all temporary also gives you hope. Like, and I think hope is such an incredible, powerful thing. It's like this, I believe in this beautiful mix of hope and knowing. Because I think, you know, hope can become, uh, I don't want to say dangerous in some terms, but sometimes hope can feel so distant. I love that. You got to, everything is, everything is temporary. And we, I'm, I'm big on hope as well. And I'm big on, everything working out, but I don't think anything happens by mistake either. I don't think anything happens on accident. I really feel like uh, it's important to like empower people in the way where our choices matter. The things that we show up and we choose to do every day, they add up. Like I said, I have ADHD. So my mind is in a bunch of different places all the different times. And I'm an artist and creative person. So right there, you have a whole mess of like, how do you get anything done? creatively, especially when you work for yourself and you're your own boss, you're in charge of your own destiny with all that kind of stuff. I'm big on setting tasks for myself. Like I know I'm going to wake up, I'm going to do certain things every day, it may not be in a certain time frame, but I'd like to get this done today or this week or this month or, or this year. Um, not necessarily goals, but just ideas of places that I want to go or things I want to learn or to do. And I think that those milestones that we set for ourselves are really important just knowing too like when you when you complete a goal it doesn't end the journey so i guess that's like the terminology i struggle with because i i don't like the idea of a set goal where i'm going and i finish and i'm done because what i've realized is the biggest dreams that you will have in life if you're going after them like you're going to reach them at some point you will obtain them you will succeed like good things will happen but then what happens is you stand on top of that mountaintop or whatever it may be. And you go, what now? What next? Where do I go? Like, this is all I've been working for. And so maybe people have stood there a few times and it may be any realm of their like personal journey or healing or, you know, their job or career or their dream or whatever it may be. You have to understand that that the goals aren't the point. It's the process. It's the journey between goals that everything in life, Matt, that's where it all matters. It's that saying, right? It's not about the outcome. It's about the journey or it's not about the end result. It's about the process because life is happening right now in the present moment. It's not happening in that year or two or five when you reach that goal. It's happening here and now. And if you're not here for whatever that moment holds for you, you're missing out. That's exactly right. Because we are, we are sold this idea. And I think that it is just the, how life has always been and how it will be on some level that like we are sold tools and, and end results. Like they are packaged up and being like, do all these things and get to this point And then it'll, everything will feel good. You'll be happy. You'll be successful. You'll look better. You'll feel better. All these kind of things. But if you do these 10 things and you get this box and you open that box and that's happiness. Well, that's not how any of it works, really. If you've, if you've ever tried that, which I have so many times, yeah, like the box just too. is, you open it up and it doesn't give you anything else. It's just like, okay, well, that helped me for a little bit. So what changed my life and what I like to incorporate into my work and just in general is, is falling in love with the process. 
whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, wherever you're going, um, you know, for hiking, for example, if you don't love the part of it that sucks, and if you're just looking for the part of it with the good views and all the mountaintops and the perfect weather, then you won't really enjoy anything that you ever do hiking because the weather changes and, and the environments change. And that's how everything is. When I really fell in love with painting, um, it was a few years back. I've painted for a long time, but I really decided I had a quote that was like, I'm going to lean into it. And that just me for, that meant for me that every day I'm going to wake up and I'm going to try. I'm going to paint every day. I'm going to experiment. I'm going to fail. I'm going to learn. And through it all, it wasn't, I was producing work as I was going, but it wasn't ever about the produced work. It was about the excitement I had of showing up and doing the work every day. It was new materials and new paints and new techniques and, and failing and starting again and going from scratch and building something new. Like I would wake up and I would heart, I would, you know, it's one of those dreams where you can't sleep at night because the next day you want to wake up and you want to experiment and you want to try it again. Like that secret and that is the joy of life, whatever it may be, you know, creatively, that's where I relate to because that's my kind of personality. But I think a lot of people feel that in in whatever their career may be or their passions or their or their life, the happiness is in falling in love with doing the process toward the thing. It's never the thing. It's never the result. It's never the goal. It's never the achievement. It's all of those steps along the way that add excitement to your days, you know? And so I'm, I'm big on that for sure. I think everyone comes to this understanding at some point in their life, you know? I think at some point we all have that understanding that the life is in every single step. It's in every single step of the hike, but it's not the summit. It's not just the summit. It's what got you there as well. That's right. And I, I call it the luxury of time. And I think that when we, it's the luxury of time is first of all, gathering up enough time to sit and reflect. Um, a lot of, most people have very busy lives you know, uh, working and family and going here and there and all over the places. And, but to like find some time where you can stop and reflect, like you're saying on the journey, on the steps, on the process, whatever it may be, it is a learned skill, um, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of like the craziest moments of your life. If it's just sitting in the car before meetings or a few minutes of reflection, you know, during the day, um, when you're drinking coffee, I started it, the mindfulness just I tagged on to things I was already doing. So again, this is like a tool that I that I've used in my life and it's something that really helps me because I'm I forget things that I want to work on. So like when I really wanted to start being mindful, uh, I drink coffee every morning. And so when I would drink coffee every morning, I would do my best to be like, okay, this is going to be a couple minutes of mindfulness, of reflection. And so it was a process and I would forget a lot of days and I would do my best. But then over and over now through the course of that my life to that point, then I remember to be reflective in those times. So like that morning copy for me still is a time where I, I go through my thoughts, I channel what I'm thinking or I'm feeling. And that's usually when I'm writing too. So if I'm making a post for the day, or I'm just like journaling something for myself, I'm creating something usually in the morning. And so that's, that's just come from the skill and that tool of just tagging something on to something I was already doing. Like if you're brushing your teeth, if you brush your teeth every day, which I hope everybody does, um, you know, that's an easy time to just be reflective of the moment. So I'm going to brush my teeth for 30 seconds. I'm thinking about a few things maybe I'm grateful for or that happened today, or I'm just processing an emotion. Then bam, I'm done brushing my teeth. And, and that can be it. Maybe that's all the reflection that you do for that day. And that is a successful day. So it's just like tagging on mindfulness to things you're already doing, I think is a really powerful tool. Yeah. And honestly, so not easy because it's not necessarily easy, but accessible. Um, thank you for saying like that, because I think also sometimes people are like, well, I don't have time to sit for an hour and reflect. You know, my life is busy. Right. You know, so that being able to find those moments of mindfulness, almost those moments of meditation, reflection as you're doing something, maybe you're doing it while you're cooking a meal or prepping a meal for yourself. But yes, I love that tagging it onto things that you're already doing that can give you that moment because it can, I feel like mindfulness, this entire 
uh, personal development, self-growth world is so beautiful and offers so many tools, but sometimes can feel so overwhelming to, you know, day-to-day -day average living. And so I think finding these pockets, finding these moments to just bring yourself back to you throughout the day. And then again, like you said, that muscle, like building it up where it becomes more second nature. It's like learning to drive, right? The first time you're like, okay, the pedal, the, the stick, the wheel, there's so much, but now it's like you're driving. And for me, sometimes driving is the most meditative. I have nothing on and I can just like let my mind do what it needs to do. And I'm not even thinking about driving. So it's just building it up to whatever resonates and works with your schedule and with your own life. That's right. It's like when um, I am finishing my newest book, Hopeful Traveler, and there's a part in there where I talk about that exactly, that exact same thing where it's like when I first, um, I was teaching and doing art and writing all at the same time. And then it came to a point where I loved them both and I loved being a teacher and I still do, but art. And what I was doing became too much. Um, if you know anyone who is a teacher, it's a really difficult, demanding, beautiful job. And if you're doing something that is also really demanding and difficult and beautiful, they really have a hard time working together. And so what I did was, and so I chose to go full-time for art and, and writing and, and it worked out great. But when I first started, especially I was working all the time as anyone does, who does anything for themselves, you know, you work day and night, um, all day and all night. And you do that enough days in a row and enough weeks in a row and enough months and you get really strung out and worn out and burn out and all the outs. Um, so I decided like, this isn't healthy. This isn't a good way to live. I'm enjoying what I do. I love it. I'm passionate, but man, I got nothing left. So one night uh, with my daughters, I were just sitting outside on a summer night and it was a sunset coming down, which we like to watch. And I was just sitting in a chair outside and I was thinking, I need more of this in my life somehow that I'm getting currently. Um, here I am pursuing my dreams and my goals for my life, but I'm missing out. And so from that moment, it was, a, it was like one of those things that just clicks in your head. And you realize, I, I told myself, no matter what I'm doing, no matter how busy I am that day, I need to have all my work done. I need to be completely done by the time the sun is setting so I can sit in the yard and I can watch the sunset out the backyard. And we have a really good view. And the sun sets every night and it's a beautiful reminder when it's going down, like, hey, that was the first huge step in my life that told me I can step away from what I loved and it wasn't a bad thing, right? I could take a break. Okay, well, oh, the sun's setting. It's time to put down the paints. It's time to put down the words. I need to go outside and enjoy the night. And it started there and I've added more time and I've added growth to that. But that, that single idea, like you were saying, it was something that was happening every day, something that happens every day um, that I could pay attention to. And so once I started paying attention to that, everything changed for sure. Yeah. And I think it's hard sometimes when you are doing something that you love, there is almost kind of like a guilt to pull yourself away from that, especially when you are starting something new because you're like, well, no, I should be focusing. Everything should be. And I do love this, but it's like, OK, even if you love it there's still life. You know, it is, it's, it's that interesting balance, I think, to find, to remember, to stop, to be like, oh, right. Life is also still happening all around me. Yeah, it is. It's a, but it's hard. It's a hard skill to, to master. Maybe, you know, when I'm, when I'm done with this life, I'll have a better understanding of what that feels like to have a completely balanced, you know, path. But just, I would, if I gave any advice, which I try not to do, it's just don't be too hard on yourself when you're trying to get somewhere you want to go. Um, the path is going to change. You're going to make a bunch of mistakes. You're going to fall on your face. You're going to look like a fool, hopefully. You know, you're going to embarrass yourself if you're not willing to embarrass yourself and, and kind of go through those processes that don't feel good. You probably won't end up going to the place you want to go. You're going to end up somewhere that's easier. You're going to end up somewhere that's maybe, you know, not as, a, not as interesting to you. Maybe your heart won't be satisfied. Um, but when you're, when you're going on a path, when you're getting somewhere you want to go, um, making those mistakes, is, is, it's a part of it. And it's a beautiful part of it. If you learn to embrace it, you're like, oh yeah, you look back, you look at those moments where things get, didn't end up the way you thought they would. And they end up being your favorite memories anyway. And the places you really wanted to go, you, you, you end up there and 
they're not quite as good as you thought they would be. And so the, I think doing that enough times in life, you realize that the bouncing around, the falling down, the standing back up, the figuring it out, that's the fun stuff in life. And that's the stuff I really love. Yeah. And then the exciting part about that is that when the next thing kind of shows up, you're like, okay, cool. Uh, Which way is this going to go? Like, it's just, for me, it's not that it's always fun. Trust me, it is not always fun. But I am able now to be like, all right, universe, I wanted to go th that way. Now I'm going this way. Not at all what I was intending on, but like, let's play. Right. It is exciting. And I think that 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 excitement comes from like, again, like we've said, being there and experiencing something before and knowing that things are about to change. And I think that is true with mental health as well for people. Everybody has their own kind of brain makeup, whatever it may be. And, and um, you know, some people struggle with depression or anxiety or a mix of everything. But for those who have a bit of darkness that comes sometimes, it's that experience too. And it's like recognizing that this period, like we said before, won't last forever, but also every now and then when it, when it comes back to me, the thing I'm excited about it isn't right, but I know something's going to come from it. Usually like after I have a, a, a big time of creativity, you know, you spend a lot of energy, spend a lot of life. There's a lot that goes into a new series and you're tired and worn out afterwards. And then you kind of like, you know, you, you not have a breakdown, but you break down and you rest in and you settle. And then maybe in that settling time, you know, a bit of that dark moment comes through. And I think in the past that may have been scary, right? Because it was like, oh man, so heavy. It's so difficult. These times feel so hard. I don't want to do this. But in those moments now, I like to tell myself that it's okay. Like I said, it's not going to last forever. And also on the other side of this, if you pay attention, there's going to be something new and creative and beautiful. If we can, if you can just give yourself time to rest and give yourself time to recoup and make it through, I promise you on the other side of this, it's going to be interesting because I've lived through it enough times that doesn't always happen. You know, sometimes bad times just bump into other difficult times and that's okay too. It doesn't always, there isn't always a pot of gold at the end of that rainbow, but enough times where I know that it's worth giving myself the grace and then giving other people grace because on the other side of that journey typically is something better or something interesting or something that you're going to learn in a new way. So that's what I found at least in life. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of your series, mm -hmm. when you create a series, how do those series kind of come to you usually? It's a building and it's a weird experience, honestly. Um, it's a weird, beautiful, complicated experience where most of my career has been learning and it still is always learn. Like, uh, I'm an amateur doing this thing professionally. I think that's how most people will feel hopefully forever. Like you're always kind of like tweaking, you're always learning, but especially for me, I feel like I'm learning more and more all the time. And so a lot of times when I'm spending it, I'm creating and I'm learning and I'm kind of building a certain technique and I'm working in the background for weeks or months. And if something just clicks like that, and then all of a sudden, everything that I've been doing, I can see the path where it needs to go. And that's kind of where I set forward. I'm like, okay, now I can see 10 paintings in the series. I can see the, the themes I want to do. I can sit down. I can think about each one. Uh, and then, they, then the creation happens. So it's like, usually I've, I'm going through something very powerfully emotionally or physically or spiritually. I'm just thinking a lot on a certain subject that all of a sudden it's like, it's like lightning strikes, but it like catches the forest on fire. It's not just a moment. It's all of a sudden everything kind of goes up in this big plume of fire and smoke and chaos. But from that new growth happens and new beauty is born. And I feel like once that happens and then that once that's finished, I find it hard to go back. So it's like used to, I, I would do a lot of like, if someone really liked a certain painting in a certain series, I could go back. I could draw from that again and create something in that. I don't do that as much these days, not because I don't enjoy it. I still love it, but I, I can't be there right away. If I'm, if I've worked through a series and it's done for me, it's done. And I may not come back to it, or it may be a long time before I can come back to it. Cause I feel like I've said all I wanted to say with it. And, um, that's where I'm going to leave it. So 
Yeah, it's it's a bit of controlled chaos, but I also can feel it happening. And when it's not happening, it's really difficult because you want to force it and you want to go out and you want to create work and there is nothing there. You still show up and do the work. You know, you, you go out and you try something and you just fail and fail and fail. And you're like, ah, oh, hope this doesn't last forever. And it doesn't. Oh, that's so cool. So in your series, I know that you use your writing in your paintings as well. Does that kind of all come to you when that lightning hits you? Or do you usually have certain writing pieces or does kind of a, a painting sometimes start and then the writing piece comes to you after or you think of putting one with it or talk to me about that process? Yeah, it, it really is. Um, it's unique for for different things. First of all, like when I'm with a series, the paintings and the poems are, they're tied together always. Sometimes the words come first and sometimes the painting comes first. Certain series, all the paintings come first and then all the words come after it. Um, they, they like the art will speak first, but then again, there are certain poems that really, um, resonate with people regularly. And I like to create kind of like standalone pieces that go with those as well more often. Because, you know, maybe I'll create a couple of those a year, but it's someone's favorite poem and it's something that really speaks to me. And I can always kind of go back to certain ones and like draw inspiration from those. Um, and so there are some standards that I create regularly from you know, as like standalones or a part of a series maybe. But typically these days, um, I'm working with a set of paintings. And once those paintings are done or as I'm creating those paintings, the words come after. So it'll be like, a couple of series ago, I was, um, it was about music and that's what I was really experiencing. It was really moving me so much. And it's always about music, but it was specific for that. And the recent one now is like my words of light where it's like the new year is starting off with just like really bright and powerful, like color. Um, I get like seasonal blues when it comes around. Um, we are here in Indiana is where I'm from. And January, February rolls around. And if there isn't snow, which I love snow, it becomes gray and the clouds are kind of, it's just less sunshine, um, which sunshine is important for the brain. And so I just fill my life with color during those times. So the series that come out are very intentional. I'm like, when I'm out working, I want to be very colorful and very bright because it helps my brain feel better. So that's the simplest form to the product. Yeah. You know? Yeah. When you say certain um, poems resonate with certain people, I just want to dip for a moment into how does it feel for you when so many people online or social media or, I mean, I know people probably come into the gallery too to speak with you. I don't know if most of your engagement is more online versus in person, but as an artist, how does it feel for you when you have so many people just resonating, sharing your work, feeling seen by it? I mean, it is, it's incredible in the way where I think that I separate myself a lot from, from me and the work in the way once, once I write something or I paint something or I create something, I just give it out um, to, the, you know, to the world and however people want to use it and share it. And that's kind of their thing now. And so it, it kind of gives me some freedom because I think, again, it's like establishing boundaries and like a little bit of separation from, from what you do and who you are, they are intertwined, but it's also like letting them have their own space to live. And so I, I love that people share it and I love that it connects, but I also want them to know that once it's written or created, it's theirs, you know, it's theirs to take and it's theirs to interpret and theirs to share and, and to use how they want to. And I don't. I don't necessarily see it as like them using my words or, or whatever and sharing it and feeling connected in that way. I love that, but I just see it as people understanding or seeing a part of themselves that maybe they didn't understand before. And it's helped them clarify that for themselves a little bit better. And then they carry that with them. So they, they won't remember that, you know, it has Topher Kirby's name on it, or there was a, one of my quotes or something, but they will carry maybe a bit of truth that they understood in a new way and that they just feel better and more whole because of that. So I guess 
my goal would be for people to read it or to see it, to take it in and to forget that I did it and just carry it on as like a part of the a wisdom they've learned in their life along the way. Wow. Wow. That's, that's inspiration if I've ever heard it right there. Do you try to connect with your online audience a lot, often? How do you navigate it? Boundaries are everything um, in life. But specifically, if you are a creative person and you're creating to share on any form of like social media um, avenue, which we all do, like it's, it's a, it comes with a sphere of negatives for sure. But it's also like the greatest time to be a creative person in the way where we have a, even if it's an audience of 50, what a privilege to share your work with that amount of people, how hard it has been for creatives and artists and anyone to like get 50 people in the world to look at what you've done so first of all just just kind of acknowledging how cool it is um if you can get past the negative stuff and you know the trolls and all the kind of comments and it is a rough place out there but also you have to kind of let it exist in its own space so what i do is i have a certain amount i have a certain time that kind of post every day I have a i have a, I'm, again i'm structured in the way where i do it i like to keep myself on schedule, but I also set it and kind of forget it in that kind of way. I give myself a certain amount of time where I'll reply to comments or go back and check. I'm not on there all, all the time checking or responding or anything. I, I let it cook. I like let it set up. I let it do its thing and let people take it and, and go with it in the way they want to. But like, I also have, um, you know, my boundaries are sacred in my own life too. It's like, if I were on there all the time or just interacting all the time in that space, I wouldn't have a healthy and happy and loving life outside of that. And the same is true. It's like if I brought all of that life into here, it, it wouldn't be the same either. So it's establishing what that place is for me. It's a place where I can share my work, uh, conduct business, connect with people in a powerful way in that way. But then also I can set that aside and know that life is different than that too. Like, even if you're creating work that you believe in and that's from the deepest parts of you and that you connect with deeply, it's still good to have a separation from those spaces, from your, from your real life and from your online life. Um, I'm just not big on, of course, maybe it's just, again, who I am or what stage of life I am of, of having those tightly connected all the time. It just doesn't, I feel like it's healthier to have a bit of boundaries with those for sure. Were you ever nervous? I mean, sometimes I feel like it's a very vulnerable thing to share your art, your anything with, you know, the public in such a public space. Could you speak to me a little bit about that? Absolutely. And I think still it is. I think, you know, in certain aspects, it's constantly like not convincing yourself that you can do this, this thing that maybe you're not you don't have all the skills for it. I don't consider myself an extrovert by any, you know, stretch of the imagination. I'm somewhere on the between introvert and extrovert. I like my alone time, but I do like my people time. So it's like sharing hard truths from ourselves, especially when I first began was, was really difficult because like I said um, earlier, I write and I create from my personal experience. I'm not an artist or a writer who can just gather things up from ideas of life. I have to have lived it or experienced it. I have to have processed it in some way or had a deep conversation with someone who's, who's allowed me to see it in a way for me to write about it. Or I don't feel honest. I feel like um, I'm selling snake oil or something that I don't really believe. And I can't do that. I don't do it because it's like, that's the one thing in life that kind of you know, doesn't make me feel great. I feel like I'm being pushed in a certain direction from someone. So that's why the the last few books and all the books, I, I always wanted to create work that was inspirational and hopeful, but I knew I couldn't write it from a place that I hadn't experienced it yet. I I waited until I was able to push through enough times to understand how it worked and that that those difficult moments, how to work through them because I was living through so many times where it kept knocking me back. And I was like, well, I'll be there one day. I'll be there one day. And when I get there, this is the message I want to share. 
And so, um, yeah, it is hard. You open yourself up and you tell, you share the deepest parts of yourselves with others. And you think, oh my gosh, like, this is so embarrassing. This is so uncomfortable. This is the worst. But then you get people who read it and they connect with it. And they say, I felt that way. And now I don't feel as alone or I don't feel as dumb or as silly or as, or as whatever it may be because, oh, there's someone else and they're, they're sharing it with everybody. You know, look at them. They're putting their, you know, and so it's like, my stuff isn't so bad. Like, cause they experience the same thing. And it's like, well, yeah, I experienced the same thing. Oh, me too. Me too. Me too. Then everybody's has their hands up and we all realize like, oh yeah, we're just human beings. Like we're all just messing up the best we can, you know? And so once you do that enough and you share that enough, it gets easier, I guess, but it also, you just know the results are worth it. Yeah. And I think that building of community like that, I know for me, that's been one of the greatest payoffs in sharing, even just like my own bits or my own story or my own artistry, because it is, it's, it's a very scary thing at first. And it's not that it's not that I was ever seeking validation in it, but when you have that confirmation from people that are like, hey, I see you and I get it, it does make it a little more comfortable to do it again. <laughs> because a absolutely. That's the thing. We keep doing it. And each time, you know, it either becomes a little easier or we're pushing like our comfort threshold a little bit more. It's about consistency and doing things over and over and over again until you either get comfortable with it or maybe not the act, but you, again, you get comfortable with the result of the act. And so I'm big on that as well. And I think that that's where I am now is because of that choice is just to continue to do something enough to where it becomes just part of your existence. Like I wouldn't, it's not like I, anything that I do now creatively um, for my work, I just do it because it's part of who I am. And it's part of who I am because I put in all of those like, yeah, those muscle memory pieces of my life that I do it over and over again every day. Like I paint every day, I write every day or whatever every day. Um, you incorporate it into your daily life and you just wake up and be like, well, this is part of my day, you know? And so that's where you get the furthest in your journey is making it just like part of breathing. You know, it's, if it's creating, if it's learning, if it's experiencing something that you want to in a new way, just start doing it as much as you can until it becomes like, yeah, the threads of your life, you know, hold you together. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up here because I do so appreciate your time as well. I'm going to ask you two more questions. Okay. I'm doing this with every guest this season. Given that the name of the show is called Gratitude and Growth, would you be willing to share with me one thing you're grateful for right now and one thing you're growing through right now? Yeah. Okay. Those are great questions. Um, grateful and growing through right now. Hmm. Well, grateful part is easy. Um, I am definitely grateful for the opportunity to share the work in the way that I can with people. I'm grateful that they do connect um, with it in a powerful way. And that I do feel part of a community, which is important for me to have that feeling. Um, I think that sense of belonging has been something that has been important to me my whole life. And in some weird abstract way, um, sharing bits and pieces of ourselves on the internet does kind of weave these threads and pull us all together in these beautiful ways where we do feel less alone, even when we are alone, maybe wherever we are in life, you know, we could be going through the most difficult moments, um, and but still like find these pieces of other people experiencing those things. When it's all brought together, um, it does feel like a community. And I'm grateful for that, for sure. Something I'm growing through right now, um, always, constantly. Right now, I think, that was a good question. Um, I'm talking about a lot of mindfulness today, um, but it's something that I keep recycling back toward. And I think it's the stillness and understanding that there, there's still growth there to happen. And so it's like understanding that even though we maybe understand part of that journey, um, there is still more to kind of unpack. And so it's like understanding that we aren't 
it's okay to continue to fail at something that we've also put a lot of work into. So that, that growth for me is, I think that's part of my life right now. There are elements of myself that I have like tidied up and gotten together, but maybe they've, they still need some work. And so that's where I am with that journey right now. So, and it's exciting. I love it. I like that part. I like putting in the work. I like learning new things. I like discovering parts of myself that, um, that I've never known before. So that's a good time. Topher, thank you so much for sharing all of that with me. Thanks for having me. It's been awesome. I really appreciate it. It was really, it was a joy. So thanks again. Of course. And thank you everyone for listening today. As always, stay grateful and keep growing. I'll chat with you next week. Thank you so much for tuning in today. If you liked what you heard, hit that subscribe button and maybe send it to someone who you think might need to hear today's message. And let me know how everything's sitting. Leave me a rating and a review and let me know what's resonating with you. What do you want to hear more of? What's your favorite episode and why? And I hope you find your way back here to another episode, another time, as we keep exploring this beautiful and wild thing that we all call life.